Welcome to Bite at a Time Books, where we read you your favorite classics one bite at a time. My name is Bree Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. If you want to know what's coming next and vote on upcoming books, sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. You'll also find our new t-shirts in the shop. More to come with quotes from your favorite classic novels. Be sure to follow my show on your favorite podcast platform so you get all the new episodes. You can find most of our links in the show notes, but also our website, biteatatimebooks.com, includes all of the links for our show, including to our Patreon to support the show, and YouTube, where we have special behind the narration of the episodes. We're part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you'd also like to hear what inspired your favorite classic author to write their novels and what was going on in the world at the time, check out Bite at a Time Books Behind the Story podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Today we'll be continuing Rainbow Valley by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 26. Miss Cornelia Gets a New Point of View. Susan... After I'm dead, I'm going to come back to Earth every time when the daffodils blow in this garden, said Anne rapturously. Nobody may see me, but I'll be here. If anybody is in the garden at the time, I think I'll come on an evening just like this. But it might be just at dawn. A lovely pale pink spring dawn. They'll just see the daffodils nodding wildly as if an extra gust of wind had blown past them. But it will be I... Indeed, Mrs. Doctor, dear. You will not be thinking of flaunting worldly things like daffies after you are dead, said Susan. And I do not believe in ghosts, seen or unseen. Oh, Susan, I shall not be a ghost. That has such a horrible sound. I shall just be me. And I shall run around in the twilight, whether it is morn or eve, and see all the spots I love. Do you remember how badly I felt when I left our little house of dreams, Susan? I thought I could never love Ingleside so well. But I do. I love every inch of the ground and every stick and stone on it. I am rather fond of the place myself, said Susan, who would have died if she had been removed from it. But we must not set our affections too much on earthly things, Mrs. Doctor, dear. There are such things as fires and earthquakes." We should always be prepared. The Tom McAllisters over harbor were burned out three nights ago. Some say Tom McAllister set the house on fire himself to get the insurance. That may or may not be. But I advise the doctor to have our chimney seen to at once. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. But I see Mrs. Marshall Elliott coming in the gate, looking as if she had been sent for and couldn't go. Anne, dearie, have you seen the journal today? Miss Cornelia's voice was trembling, partly from emotion, partly from the fact that she had hurried up from the store too fast and lost her breath. Anne bent over the daffodils to hide a smile. She and Gilbert had laughed heartily and heartlessly over the front page of the journal that day, but she knew that to dear Miss Cornelia it was almost a tragedy, and she must not wound her feelings by any display of levity. Isn't it dreadful? "'What is to be done?' asked Miss Cornelia despairingly. Miss Cornelia had vowed that she was done with worrying over the pranks of the manse children, but she went on worrying just the same. Anne led the way to the veranda, where Susan was knitting with Shirley and Rilla conning their primers on either side. Susan was already on her second pair of stockings for Faith. Susan never worried over poor humanity. She did what in her lay for its betterment, and serenely left the rest to the higher powers. Cornelia Elliot thinks she was born to run this world, Mrs. Dr. Dear, she had once said to Anne, and so she's always in a stew over something. I've never thought I was, and so I go calmly along. Not but what it has sometimes occurred to me that things might be run a little better than they are, but it is not for us poor worms to nourish such thoughts. They only make us uncomfortable and do not get us anywhere. I don't see that anything can be done. Now, said Anne, pulling out a nice cushiony chair for Miss Cornelia. But how in the world did Mr. Vickers allow that letter to be printed? 
Surely he should have known better. Why, he's away, Anne dearie. He's been away to New Brunswick for a week, and that young scalawag of a Joe Vickers is editing the journal in his absence. Of course, Mr. Vickers would never have put it in, even if he is a Methodist, but Joe would just think it a good joke. As you say, I don't suppose there's anything to be done now, only live it down. But if I ever get Joe Vickers cornered somewhere I'll give him a talking to, he won't forget in a hurry. I wanted Marshall to stop our subscription to the journal instantly. But he only laughed and said that today's issue was the only one that had had anything readable in it for a year. Marshall never will take anything seriously, just like a man. Fortunately, Evan Boyd is like that too. He takes it as a joke and is laughing all over the place about it. And he's another Methodist. As for Mrs. Burr of Upper Glen, of course she'll be furious and they will leave the church. Not that it will be a great loss from any point of view. The Methodists are quite welcome to them. It serves Mrs. Burr right, said Susan, who had an old feud with the lady in question and had been hugely tickled over the reference to her in Faith's letter. She will find that she will not be able to cheat the Methodist parson out of his salary with bad yarn. The worst of it is there's not much hope of things getting any better, said Miss Cornelia gloomily. As long as Mr. Meredith is going to see Rosemary West, I did hope the manse would soon have a proper mistress, but that is all off. I suppose she wouldn't have him on account of the children. At least, everybody seems to think so. I do not believe that he ever asked her, said Susan who could not conceive of anyone refusing a minister. Well, nobody knows anything about that, but one thing is certain, he doesn't go there any longer, and Rosemary didn't look well all the spring. I hope her visit to Kingsport will do her good. She's been gone for a month and will stay another month, I understand. I can't remember when Rosemary was away from home before. She and Ellen could never bear to be parted, but I understand Ellen insisted on her going this time. And meanwhile, Ellen and Norman Douglas are warming up the old soup. Is that really so? Asked Anne, laughing. I heard a rumor of it, but I hardly believed it. Believe it. You may believe it all right, Anne, dearie. Nobody's in ignorance of it. Norman Douglas never left anybody in doubt as to his intentions in regard to anything. He always did his courting before the public. He told Marshall that he hadn't thought about Ellen for years, but the first time he went to church last fall, he saw her and fell in love with her all over again. He said he'd clean forgot how handsome she was. He hadn't seen her for 20 years, if you can believe it. Of course, he never went to church, and Ellen never went anywhere else round here. Oh, we all know what Norman means, but what Ellen means is a different matter. I shan't take it upon me to predict whether it will be a match or not. He jilted her once. But it seems that does not count with some people, Mrs. Dr. dear, Susan remarked rather acidly. He jilted her in a fit of temper and repented it all his life, said Miss Cornelia. That is different from a cold-blooded jilting. For my part, I never detested Norman as some folks do. He could never overcrow me. I do wonder what started him coming to church. I've never been able to believe Mrs. Wilson's story that Faith Meredith went there and bullied him into it. I've always intended to ask Faith herself, but I've never happened to think of it just when I saw her. What influence could she have over Norman Douglas? He was in the store when I left, bellowing with laughter over that scandalous letter. You could have heard him at Four Winds Point. The greatest girl in the world, he was shouting. She's that full of spunk she's bursting with it, and all the old grannies want to tame her, darn them. But they'll never be able to do it. Never. They might as well try to drown a fish. Boyd, you see that you put more fertilizer on your potatoes next year. Ho, ho, ho. And then he laughed till the roof shook. Mr. Douglas pays well to the salary, at least, remarked Susan. Oh, Norman isn't mean in some ways. He'd give a thousand without blinking a lash and roar like a bull of bashin if he had to pay five cents too much for anything. Besides, he likes Mr. Meredith's sermons, and Norman Douglas was always willing to shell out if he got his brains tickled up. There's no more Christianity about him than there is about a black, naked heathen in Africa and never will be. But he's clever and well-read, and he judges sermons as he would lectures. Anyhow, it's well he backs up Mr. Meredith and the children as he does, for they'll need friends more than ever after this. I'm tired of making excuses for them, believe me. Do you know, dear Miss Cornelia, said Anne seriously, I think we've all been making too many excuses. It is very foolish and we ought to stop it. I'm going to tell you what I'd like to do. I shan't do it, of course. Anne had noted a glint of alarm in Susan's eye. It would be too unconventional. 
and we must be conventional or die after we reach what is supposed to be a dignified age. But I'd like to do it. I'd like to call a meeting of the ladies' aid in WMS and the Girl Sewing Society, and include in the audience all and any Methodists who've been criticizing the Merediths. Although I do think if we Presbyterians stopped criticizing and excusing, we would find that other denominations would trouble themselves very little about our manse folks. I would say to them, dear Christian friends, with marked emphasis on Christian, I have something to say to you, and I want to say it good and hard, that you may take it home and repeat it to your families. You Methodists need not pity us, and we Presbyterians need not pity ourselves. We are not going to do it anymore, and we're going to say boldly and truthfully to all critics and sympathizers, we are proud of our minister and his family. Mr. Meredith is the best preacher Glen St. Mary Church ever had. Moreover, he is a sincere, earnest teacher of truth and Christian charity. He's a faithful friend, a judicious pastor in all essentials, and a refined, scholarly, well-bred man. His family are worthy of him. Gerald Meredith is the cleverest pupil in the Glen School, and Mr. Hazard says that he is destined to a brilliant career. He is a manly, honorable, truthful little fellow. Faith Meredith is a beauty, and as inspiring and original as she is beautiful, there's nothing commonplace about her. All the other girls in the Glen put together haven't the vim and wit and joyousness and spunk she has. She has not an enemy in the world. Everyone who knows her loves her. Of how many children or grown-ups can that be said? Una Meredith is sweetness personified. She will make a most lovable woman. Carl Meredith, with his love for ants and frogs and spiders, will someday be a naturalist whom all Canada, nay, all the world will delight to honor. Do you know of any other family in the Glen? Or out of it, of whom all these things can be said? Away with shame-faced excuses and apologies. We rejoice in our minister and the his splendid boys and girls. And stopped. Partly because she was out of breath after her vehement speech, and partly because she could not trust herself to speak further in view of Miss Cornelia's face. That good lady was staring helplessly at Anne, apparently engulfed in billows of new ideas, but she came up with a gasp and struck out for sure gallantly. Anne Blythe, I wish you would call that meeting and say just that. You've made me ashamed of myself for one, and far be it from me to refuse to admit it. Of course, that is how we should have talked, especially to the Methodists. And it's every word of it true. Every word. We've just been shutting our eyes to the big worthwhile things and squinting them on the little things that don't really matter a pin's worth. Oh, Anne, dearie, I can see a thing when it's hammered into my head. No more apologizing for Cornelia Marshall. I shall hold my head up after this, believe me. Though I may talk things over with you as usual just to relieve my feelings if the Merediths do any more startling stunts. Even that letter I felt so bad about. Why, it's only a good joke, after all, as Norman says. Not many girls would have been cute enough to think of writing it, and all punctuated so nicely and not one word misspelled. Just let me hear any Methodist say one word about it. Though all the same, I'll never forgive Joe Vickers, believe me. Where are the rest of your small fry tonight? Walter and the twins are in Rainbow Valley. Jem is studying in the garret. They're all crazy about Rainbow Valley. Mary Vance thinks it's the only place in the world. She'd be off up here every evening if I'd let her, but I don't encourage her in godding. Besides, I miss the creature when she isn't around, and dearie. I never thought I'd get so fond of her. Not but what I see her faults and try to correct them. But she's never said one saucy word to me since she came to my house, and she's a great help. For when all is said and done, and dearie, I'm not so young as I once was, and there's no sense denying it. I was 59 my last birthday. I don't feel it, but there is no gainsaying the family Bible. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books today, while we read a bite of one of your favorite classics. Again, my name is Bree Carlisle, and I hope you come back tomorrow for the next bite of Rainbow Valley. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com and check out the shop. You can check out the show notes or our website, biteatatimebooks.com, for the rest of the links for our show.